Sí.
Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the 2023 Australasian Aid and International Development Conference. Uh, my name is Stephen Howes and I'm the Director of the Development Policy Centre. So on behalf of our centre uh, and of the Crawford School and of the Australian National University, uh, welcome to our conference. Of course, we'll have several more welcomes uh, as well as the official opening uh, tomorrow. But uh, thanks to everyone who's come today. Uh, today we uh, have, we call it day zero. We normally have a keynote speech. We've got several new books being launched and we have our opening reception. So it's, a, it's become a really good way to start the conference. And um, it's great to see so many people taking advantage of that. Uh, I'd also like to, uh, at the outset, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. Uh, and of course, uh, this is a uh, online event. And uh, so for those of you joining us online, uh, welcome to you as well. And we also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where you are. Uh, for today, uh, my job's very simple. I'm gonna hand over to Stephanie Kerbis campbell uh, Stephanie's very kindly agreed to chair this uh, opening uh, keynote speech. I'm sure uh, many of you, most of you will know Stephanie. I've been fortunate to know her for a long time, uh, <laughs> from her days in AusAid, and uh, our paths have overlapped. She was actually played a, a key role in helping us get our uh, foundation uh, endowment from the uh, Harold Mitchell Foundation, uh, and that really set us up. And uh, you know, without that funding, we wouldn't be here today. So that's something I'm always grateful for, Stephanie and I. I've also worked a lot together on Papua New Guinea, and in particular uh, with an NGO, Family PNG. So that's been another very uh, constructive collaboration. Um, but uh, since December, so for the last year, uh, Stephanie has been Australia's ambassador for gender equality. And uh, that's the role, you know, she's really, I think, taken to the next level. I think Stephanie said she's had 30 trips this year. Just today, she's come from another launch at ANU. Uh, so, you know, she's been, it's been a non-stop uh, engagement for her and I can think of no one better for the job. So thank you very much, Stephanie, despite your busy schedule for agreeing to chair this event. Uh, I'll hand over to you. Please welcome Stephanie Cobus campbell uh, Thank you, Stephen, and it's so good to be here. Um, Stephen noted that I had the privilege to be involved early on in the centre and indeed I still remember when Stephen came to see Harold Mitchell whose board I was on at the time and he said what he was trying to do and, and Harold said listen stop I'll fund you, he said, I'll fund you but there's one thing you're going to have to do, you're going to have to be the best in the world. Um, so no, no easy task, but you know, I think about when we started and this conference was in a little tiny room um, in a little um, tiny building and now look at it. I mean, it, it is the premier conference in the world. I'm just so proud how you have taken um, Stephen under your leadership and you know, Robin, you were there in the early days and everyone that's joined in on what the, the center has become and what we're doing and it is, um, just such an honor and a privilege to be part of that journey um, from early on. So thank you again for all of your incredible leadership and everything that you've done. So Stephen Mitch and I have done 31 overseas trips this year. It, it's 30 actually, it's actually 31. Um, so, and it, it's been 31 trips all over the world focused on really key and critical aspects of gender equality. So I've actually been able, if you can imagine, in, in all those trips with different countries, different continents, different issues, have noticed a heck of a lot of similarities. Across the world, women and girls have so many issues in common from both our challenges as well as the solutions that we bring to the table than differences. We have commonality in social norms and how all of our countries, there are these norms of what's expected of men and what's expected of women and how those norms can hold both men and women back 
girls and boys. There's not one single country in this world, not one, that has got on top of violence against women and girls. In our own country, here in Australia, we're slipping backwards in some areas. When I first started in this role in February, one, out of t one woman every 10 days was murdered by an intimate partner. That is just so unacceptable here in Australia. That figure is now one woman a week. One woman a week in our country is murdered every week at the hands of her partner. So we in Australia have a number of challenges in terms of gender equality. And of course, we share those challenges with so many countries and, and all countries around the world. And for solutions, particularly now, I have to say another, another aspect, and you know, the good news is there's so many amazing people who are working on this, but, and who are champions and who get it. But the bad news is we're up against some pretty dangerous forces. We have seen a massive setback in gender equality following COVID and its aftermath in every country in the world when falling out of the workforce increases in domestic violence. And we are also seeing across the world active pushback at every single level. We have to come together, we have to work together, we have to understand the challenges and we have to work together on the solutions if we're going to get gender equality back on track and if we're gonna make a difference for ourselves currently, for the next generation and indeed for our planet because we are not going to solve the sticky, tricky issues in this world like climate change if we don't tap into the potential of 100% of the population. We're just not. So I implore you all to, as that movie says, um, look up, you know that, don't look up. Look up, understand what's going on around you, understand the role that you can play as an individual, get the information, avoid the disinformation and the misinformation, critically understand what's going on, and we need to work together with resilience. So that's just my pitch as ambassador for gender equality before I have the great honor to introduce our guest today. And it is um, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alice Evans, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of International Development at King's College London, and currently a visiting professor in the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto in Canada. Dr. Evans has a forthcoming book, The Great Gender Divergence, um, which I know she'll share a snippet of that with us today, a, a good taster. And she's also published on a number of really important topics, including what drives support for gender equality, why are women now sharing men's roles as breadwinners but still doing the housework? Really good question. I ask my husband that occasionally as well. Um, how do cities um, catalyze social change? Why did inequality fail in Latin America? What fosters pro-labor reforms and other really important topics? So it's my pleasure today to welcome to the stage Dr. Alice Evans um, to share with us her perspectives on gender equality. Thank you.
went into depression, had heart problems, and the girl herself was depressed and locked in her room for months for dating, right? So if you contrast that to the Philippines or Cambodia or Thailand, it is a totally, totally different culture. And, you know, that's, that's not unique to Uzbekistan. In ancient Greece, women were seen as inferior and ideally secluded. Mortal women were veiled. In public discourse in ancient Greece, women's names were not uttered. Men gained honor by providing for their families and keeping their wives at home. And across, uh, pre across pre-Christian Europe and South Asia, Middle East, North Africa, East, East Asia, conformity was imperative for trust and respectability. And here you have a co collective action problem which persisted for millennia because no family wanted to deviate unilaterally or jeopardize their social connections, risk ostracism, being outcast in India, all families remain locked into that equilibrium where women's market activities were a last resort of economic desperation. So mixing and mingling with non-unrelated males risks rumor of impropriety and forfeited family honor. So as long as market wages remain meager, and that is still the case today in the Middle East, Egypt, uh, Iran, South Asia, as long as market wages are very meager, most women remain at home because it's not worth it. Families are thinking, well, I have to forfeit honor for income, and if income is very low, it's just not worth, it's just not worth women working. So in India today, for example, female labor force participation is only 20%. You know, I was, as part of my work with DFAT, I was involved in the garment industry in Cambodia and Vietnam, mostly female. In Pakistan, their garment industry is only 28% female, right? So this is big, big heterogeneity. But, and here is the really important thing. So what determines, uh, so female seclusion was the norm in, in East Asia, South Asia, the North Africa and the Middle East. It's not normative in the Pacific Island, in Oceania and in Southeast Asia. That's superbly important. Um, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and pre-conquest America were largely bilateral or matrilineal. So bilateral is shown in the purple, uh, matrilineal is shown in the green. So descent was traced down both sides of the family or just down the maternal line. And so there was no obsession with chastity because the family line was created by women. All their children were legitimate. In Cambodia, I lived in a village for three months, and that house was the traced down the family, family, the female line. The women inherited that land and lived with their kin forever. So under bilateral or matrilineal kinship, women moved more freely, they built independent networks, and they could gain respect as rulers. So folklore was seldom male biased. Language was not gendered. Now, today, matrilineal communities are typically much more supportive of female leaders. Uh, and Buddhist, uh, and wait, and since male honor isn't dependent on being a breadwinner or female chastity, female employment rises rapidly in response to job creating economic growth. So when factories opened up in Cambodia, in Vietnam, in Thailand, in Indonesia, women flocked to those jobs. And I think what's very different from East Asia is they signed those contracts themselves. In East Asia, because it was patrilineal, when the factories opened up in China and Japan, it was fathers who signed those contracts. Right, so women hopped on their scooters and they provided for their families. So uh, just to think historically, why, why was Southeast Asia different? Why was the Gulf of Guinea different? Why were the Americas different? Now, it's very difficult, and I'll be perfectly honest here, to know why people did stuff thousands and thousands of years ago. Right, especially in the prehistoric era where people are not writing, dear diary, today I became patrilineal for reasons one, two, three. But as I trace cultural evolution, as I compare across societies, I do see maybe two big uh, common trends. Uh, one, when patriarchal forces conquer territories, they tend to institutionalize patriarchy. So Southeast Asia kind of got lucky and that it wasn't conquered by those big patriarchal forces. Two, societies with scarce, valuable, inheritable assets, like land or land, were almost always patrilineal. So male relatives clustered together in these patrilocal clans to defend their land from, or herds from raiders. And in those societies, brides married into other families. Their role was to bear sons and safeguard male honor.
and men were revered as knowledgeable authorities. So what kind of predicts bilateral or matrilineal kinship is land abundance. And that's what was unique about pre-conquest America, Southeast Asia, and the Gulf of Guinea. They generally had low population density and plenty of available land. Abundant land had no market value. Forests could be cut down to create new fields. And land was abundant in places with low population density, such as in places plagued by diseases, you know, if there are parasites and pathogens in forests. And that high infant mortality combined with land abundance sustained perpetual demand for labor. And in pre-conquest Southeast Asia and the Gulf of Guinea, the major source of wealth was in control over people. So economic historians have repeatedly remarked that what was rare and valuable in Southeast Asia was people and their labor. Wealth was measured in subjects, but, um, but not in hectares. So pre-conquest uh, Southeast Asia, the Gulf of Guinea and the Americas generally had low value land and bilateral or matrilineal kinship. And so, of course, there was sub-regional heterogeneity where land was scarce and in highly commercialized regions of Java and Burma, there were pre-colonial land markets, but that was a, a small fraction. Most communities were bilateral or matrilineal. Here is a really important. Southeast Asia was not a feminist utopia. You know, women could be respected as spiritual leaders. In fact, many, most of the uh, pre-Catholic uh, spiritual authorities in the, in the Philippines were women. And if men wanted to join the priesthood, they had to be effeminate. They had to act like women. So women could also be political rulers. They could organize independent networks. When Chinese traders went to the Philippines in the 10th century, they said that you know the people they were trading from were women. So there was this long history of long distance female trade. So women had independent mobility. They were long distance merchants. But I don't want to romanticize Southeast Asia as some feminist utopia. You know, Engels conjectured that private property led to the overthrow of the female sex. And he really omits what came before, which is bonded labor. In Southeast Asia and also the Gulf of Guinea, credit was enormously expensive. The lowest interest rates may have been around 35% a year, which would have, you know, sent me to the cleaners. So indigenous legal texts in Southeast Asia imposed a maximum interest rate of 100%. So when struck by crisis and unable to afford credit, marginalized families typically turned to debt peonage. They became pawns or sold their female kin into bondage. And wealthy nobles were ready buyers because of that labor scarcity. So bonded labor was very widespread in both pre-colonial Southeast Asia and also the Gulf of Guinea. So while women could gain autonomy and prestige, and while women in wealthy, privileged, noble families could become female rulers, right, just like their brothers, their welfare was by no means secure. So what I'm saying is going back to my original point is gender discrimination was low, but everyone your likelihood was to be in bonded labor, right? So this is not a, a fantastical, a place of human rights, etc. So, you know, for most people, life was nasty, brutish, and short. So long before colonialism, long before capitalism, women were captured, sacrificed, enslaved, and died from pestilence. Now, I want to move on. Aha, aha. So this is from when I was living in... So, so, okay, so that was, that I hope is your work, very quick, very brief history of why I think Southeast Asia is very special. Um, and why female labor rises rapidly in response to job creating economic growth. Now I want to move on to another section to think about, you know, what has driven, what has promoted, and my main point here is job creating economic growth, universities, and also activism. So Southeast Asia became more gender equal in the late 20th century as a result of all those big engines of gender equality. So here I am sitting in a Cambodian village where I stayed for three months, actually preparing food with a husband because his wife has gone off to work at the garment factory on the Saturday. And it is totally normal. It was not shameful for the husband to be sharing the housework. And I travel all over the world. You know, last year I was in India, Morocco, Mexico, uh, Sardinia, Poland, Turkey, um, and you know, in many this this is rare, right? Even in Australia, this might be rare for the guy just to be sitting at home making Saturday lunch. 
So, 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 yeah, so, so, so his wife has gone off to work on the scooter. All these women are going off to work, off to work in the garment factory on the scooter. So job creating, uh -huh. so then here is a photo from Vietnam where I was doing uh, the research on garment factories and labor conditions. So job creating economic growth is the most, the most powerful engine of gender equality. But the female labor supply is mediated by culture. So I think Singapore gives us the most fascinating example. So back in the 1920s, female uh, labor force participation in Singapore was very low amongst its three uh, communities, the Chinese migrant community, the Indian Tamil community, and also the uh, Malay community. It was about 20%. It was especially low among the Malay community, indicating stronger norms of female seclusion. But it rose across all groups as women seized economic opportunities. Singapore's gender pay gap is now 6%, which you know is, is right up there at the top. You know, Women have a high share of management, so with job creating economic growth, going back to that honor income trade off, no matter how important honor is, when the income returns are so high, families are like, hell yeah, you know, let women work because then we can get a nicer house, a nicer apartment, a better car, send our children to a better school. So that is the honor income trade off. And job creating growth is the most important driver of that because as women migrate to cities, they seize economic opportunities, they gain status as providers, they broaden their horizons, they make new friends, and they come to critically reflect on inequalities. And they build that solidarity that it also existed among some in Southeast Asia long ago. So when I was doing work in, um, I did this comparative rural urban research in Cambodia, and I spent a lot of time talking to rural urban migrants, you know, poor people who come to the Phnom Penh on bursaries, etc. And they would say, you know, when I was in the village, we used to say, you know, uh, women, women are two legged, they can only walk around the kitchen or women, you know, what do women know? You know, the cafe is reserved for men. Men are the ones who are seen as knowledgeable authorities sharing information in the cafe. And so they used to think women were more ignorant. But when they came to cities, they're like, wow, you know, they see all these women in more senior positions they start chatting with their friends what like i was chatting with a couple of female uh, flight attendants and one said i saw a woman driving a tuk-tuk it means that what a man can do a woman can also do so all that diversity that heterogeneity those possibilities for association in cities can be really radically disruptive um one time i was chatting to a woman in a garment factory she lived in one of those rent rooms like a small room and she said my neighbor, her husband does the housework. So therefore I was thinking, if I am working, my husband is working, then yes, we can both do the washing up. And so she pushed her husband to do that too. So all of these different experiences in cities can be really disruptive. So it's jobs, it's cities and universities even more so, because then young people might be living independently, having a space to share ideas, thinking more deeply and broadly and becoming much more critical. So those are the big, big engines of gender equality. It's job creating economic growth. Um, okay, but, oh yes, yeah, so this is my, my photo from Hanoi, looking out onto the city and, and all that, seeing all the diversity that it brings. Okay, so now I want to speed up and think about, well, how can development cooperation promote gender equality? And, you know, ask me Q, any questions if I'm going too fast later. So I was looking at uh, Australia's uh, development cooperation ideas, and there is a lot of emphasis. Now, I'm going to be critical here, and you can push back, okay, so feel free. I was seeing that there's a lot of emphasis on gender targets. You know, we need to make sure this benefits women, this benefits the women. And maybe I want to push back on that a little bit, because sometimes these big structural drivers that I've mentioned, it will be impossible to itemize how many women that benefits, because it's a big structural change. Right. So let me give you three examples. Um, the main one of the major engines of, of gender equality is job creating economic growth, because it's only when there are more jobs, when there are higher incomes, that family consider it worthwhile for women to go out into the pu public sphere. And paid work in the public sphere is so important because that's what where women build friendships and solidarity. But that is now threatened by robotization. So since 2006, routine jobs have shrunk because jobs in manufacturing and services are threatened by labor displacing automation. Now, if demand falls, job queues will get longer in Indonesia and women will be at the back. 
So, and if that labor share of income falls, then so does local consumption. People have less money to spend on local goods and services. Male unemployment, if men cannot provide as breadwinners, if men cannot gain status, then that can also trigger hostile sexism. So for me, if I'm thinking that the big structural driver of gender equality is job creating economic growth, and that's threatened by labor displacing automation, my big question for the brilliant minds in Australia, well, how do you harness R&D? How do you think about technology? How can technology be harnessed to increase jobs rather than just displace them? For me, that is a big, big, a big, big challenge. You know, using thinking about what technologies can be supported to increase jobs rather than just displace them. You know, technology is not a bad thing in itself, but it's all about using technology to increase labor demand, which is a central driver of gender equality. So for me, that would be my number one goal, jobs, 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 and thinking about technological innovation to grow those jobs. Another important gender issue is climate breakdown. You know, when crops fail, girls are forced into early marriages. When I was in Cambodia, they'd been suffering from droughts and people were having to sell themselves into debt bondage, working in brick uh, kilns, right? So all this harsh climate stores development, which is itself a major driver of gender equality. I don't think I need to convince anyone here um, about that. So jobs, technology, mitigating climate breakdown. Another thing is migration, right? Australia obviously does very well. Well, at least compared to my terrible country of England, where we're now clamping down on migrants, right? So those three things are big, big structural drivers of gender equality. The other one, which has also been championed by CGD, which I think, uh, which I hope more in the development community focus on is lead pollution. Lead pollution is very high uh, in many low and middle income countries and it jeopardizes learning. And it also is associated with higher violence. So if we were going back to the point about, you know, how do we tackle domestic violence? You know, many, many aid agencies have promoted, you know, awareness raising, sensitization, uh, education. But to be honest, that's very hard. You know, once you're a married woman with a couple of kids, you may be reluctant to leave, leave your provider, right? It's tough. What, what will happen to the children? So instead, we might think more strategically about the root causes. And one of the root causes of violence is lead poisoning. So where it is high, we can work effectively to eliminate the source. So again, you don't need a gender target here, but for me, this seems like a driver. CGD is highlighting, and I hope many more um, focus on. Now, I also noticed in the Australian aid uh, do uh, documents, it talked about you know supporting NGOs. To me, when I look at the evidence, it actually seems there's a relatively weak evidence base of funding women's groups. What seems much more effective is having hope that change is possible through mass mobilization. Because these strong, I totally agree that strong independent are a major driver of gender equality and they are threatened by authoritarian repression more countries are becoming authoritarian at the moment in the world 64 percent of the people in the world authoritarian regime autocrats may try to provide veneers of equality by promoting women leaders only matters is this space this physical space for civil society and that's what needs to be protected it's not it's about ordinary people believing that they can go out on the streets and protest will not be violently repressed, but that protest will have some effect. The alternative is that they're totally despondent. And I see that all over the world, where people believe there is no mobilizing because they will just be violently intimidated by the police, as is happening in Bangladesh right now, right? The, the, there is despondent many people look at in, in mobilizing because they just see year after violence and repress them now i want to ha highlight another point so um indonesia for example to highlight heterogeneity within sub-saharan africa uh, within southeast asia sorry there is this this is a nice paper by leonardo burstein and alessandra vowena and others and they show that across the world people tend to massively underestimate men's support for female employment and affirmative action. In Indonesia, the gap is huge. Indonesians, if you ask them, do you support to work outside the home? They'll say, yes, 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 it's totally fine. It's like 77% say yes, yes, yes. But we ask them, do you think your neighbors, do you think you need to support this? They say, I don't think so. So it's only about percent then support it. 
So what that means is that people where men may be worried paid social disapproval. And this is just this is perception. This is pluralistic ignorance. And that reinforces the honor income trade off I talked about before. So if Indonesians care about honor, then female earnings need to be extra high to compensate for that honor. But really that that's honor ideal is an illusion because actually their neighbors aren't as judgmental as they think. So films, television and media campaign could show that women are actually generally respected if they work. So I think that's one area. So here it's important to be careful about the kind of gender sensitization that we're not doing. It's not saying, yes, it's good for women to work. It's showing actually neighbors are very supportive. They're much more supportive than you might think. So you need to give credible signals that people are uh, accepting and supportive. Whereas if you look around and everyone seems to be championing women staying at home, then you may become worried about stigma. Okay, here is my final, final point to publicize zero tolerance of abuse. So I was talking, we've been talking about uh, domestic violence, you know, what's the best, best way to combat it? And I've been, I've been studying campaigns all over the world. And they typically say, you know, gender-based violence is bad, don't beat your wife. And people may sort of ignore that. But I think what seems to be more effective is to shift expectations about how other people will react to male harassment and violence. So if the government, if the community and religious leaders condemn men who abuse their wives. They send the message that this is socially acceptable. If people come to expect punishment, then they will, you know, so you need to give a credible signal that abusers will be punished. So perpetrators will be much more, less likely to assault. If you molest, we will arrest, right? That's a credible, clear signal, and you believe the Singaporean police will do that. Um, so, so I think that's the important message. So I wanted to wrap that up. Uh, so thank you very much for letting me join you. Uh, and I, I apologize for that being a very crude whirlwind tour of Southeast Asia and global history. So yeah, to sum up, Southeast Asia, I think is super, super important and fascinating because it was this early forerunner of female political and spiritual leadership. And I think that's partly because the lack of conquest by extremely patriarchal forces and also land abundance, which enabled women to move freely, forge solidarity and gain status as respected authorities. Now, and I say all that, there were female authorities, but this was no feminist utopia. You know, weak constraints on female mobility just mean that female employment rises rapidly in response to job creating economic growth in the 20th and 21st centuries. So if I am back a little, I would say, you know, I'm not worried about a little project that benefits 100 women. You know, what is that? What is that in you know, populations of 200 million or whatever? Or even, I don't even, you know, I don't get excited about gender sensitization, gender sensitive legislation either. The big, big, big major drivers of gender equality are job creating economic growth. And the question is, how can you drive that? And how can you tackle the automation that's displacing those jobs? And how do you protect a space for civil society so that women can benefit from the solidarity that they gain through paid work in the public sphere? So thank you very much uh, for listening, and I welcome any questions about 10,000 years of patriarchy. Thank you. Oh, sorry, skip. So, wow, Dr. Evans, that was a um, very comprehensive presentation covering quite a great time span, and I certainly learned a lot, including about the history of Southeast Asia. Um, you, of course, raised the absolute importance of women's economic inclusion and jobs, which um, I know many of us will be on the same page with you there. That climate gender nexus, which we absolutely can ignore. Aspects of technology and automation, which are so important. Um, the role of men. The new issue of pollution and lead, which I haven't thought so much about, but I will now. Um, zero tolerance to violence and how we call it out, so a lot to think of. We have a bit of time for questions. Um, I might just kick off with one. I mean, you note the history of, of Southeast Asia and some really important lessons to be learned. You note the absolute importance of, of job creation, which I agree with you 100%. I still, in, in my travels throughout Southeast Asia and indeed the world, one really big challenge, and, and again, I think Singapore would share this challenge as well. I was looking up as you were talking that Singapore still only has around 23% of women on their boards and only 14% of women represented in CEOs. So 
as we look at women's economic inclusion and we talk about factories and some of those lower paid jobs, how do we use all the information that, that you kind of have shared with us in those lessons to really start to break those barriers of the sticky floor, floor problem, of the brick wall problem of getting women in, and then the glass ceiling problem of getting women to the top, which I think is a shared issue for all of us and until women are also in those managerial CEO decision-making roles, we have a ways to go. So while you're answering that, I'll get other people to think about um, their questions as well. Thanks. Do you know, I, I am not on the tourist board for Southeast Asia, but I, um, I was just reading a wonderful paper that even controlling for female labor force participation, women's share of top jobs and the proportion of female is highest truth. So Asia is a pioneer there. So I'm not saying we should all turn Buddhist, but I, I, I just wanted to stress that Southeast Asia is such, this is really amazing forerunner of female leadership. Okay, but how do you promote that even more so? How do you promote that even more so? Um, actually, I see, tremendous. you know, when I travel around the world, I spend a lot of time with students chatting to young women. And I think the current generation of young women is increasingly ambitious. You know, especially in more conservative communities, Uzbekistan, Indonesia, where girls know their education or their continued education is contingent on getting good grades. You know, they know that delaying marriage is contingent on getting good grades and proving themselves, you know, proving to their families that it's worthwhile to invest in their education and let them stay in university. They really want to prove themselves and they're very vocal and they're assertive. And I think the youngest generation, you see this in Iran too, you know, it's the youngest generation of young women that are super independent and they want to push back. You know, many have been inspired by reading English language sources on the internet or social media, they're sharing ideas and they are becoming much more radical, much more ambitious, much more career orientated. So I think that there is a lot of hope to gain from these young women who I meet in universities. Um, so I think that many of these change. So what I want to push back is like, I, for me, is I, I go back to these big structural levers that once you have job creating economic growth, once you have urbanization, once you have, you know, this uh, universities, then the young women are doing it themselves. That my role is, is zero. There's not, I really think there's very little I can do but understand that these are the big, big engines. And the more that we can help those big engines thrive, the better, and women will do it themselves. I really see that happening. Um, I, 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 I always feel a sense of optimism when I meet young women at universities all over the world. So I think, I think that is happening. Of course, there is discrimination all over the world. And, but um, let me, wait, let me say more, one more thing, why job creating human growth is so important. So if we look back at the, let me give an example from the USA. If I read studies of the USA in the 1960s, for example, Professor Claudia Golden has just won the Nobel Prize in economics. But when she started her career, economics was incredibly sexist and economics wasn't alone in being so sexist. Sociology was all also incredibly sexist. It was male dominated. You know, when young women uh, entered sociology in the 1960s, people would assume, you know, you're just someone's secretary. They did not think that they were, they did not think they were professors, right? So they were treated with disrespect. But then what happened is a surge of women entered universities. They increasingly pursued sociology and they supported each other. They supported their friends. They encouraged and inspired their friends. And then through their strength in numbers, they flooded these leaky pipelines. So even though there was discrimination, there were so many women going into sociology, they supported each other and they reached the highest levels. And now I would say there's zero discrimination in sociology. But there's, so it's where women enter a domain in, in huge numbers, they demonstrate their equal competence and they undermine people's stereotypes. So you just need that flood of women to prove they can do it. When, and when people see so many women doing it, they ring, oh yeah, actually women are equal, equally competent. So that erodes their discrimination. So it's again, this big structural force of job creating economic growth. Right, and I, I think we can continue Thanks. this conversation. I'm um, really interested in that because we're still seeing, for example, here in Australia, lots of fantastic women at university, but the minute they enter the workforce, they're slipping behind, so we need to understand that a bit better. Now, I'm opening the floor for questions. Here we go. Good. Someone roaming the mic for me, or do you want me to roam the mic? 
Can you cut it in again? Oh, yeah. Maybe we'll just take two at a time, if that's okay, because we don't have a lot of time. So question one. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Ellis. It was really nice presentation and discussion. Uh, just a quick question. First of all, my name is Didar. I'm uh, from Apt Associate. Um, I just, for me, the job creation is really a good solution for uh, bringing women on the society and, and the stuff and empower them. But at the same time, it's kind of seems like a single prescription for all disease. To what extent we can contextualize that and relate it to the cultural values and norms which abandon women to go and work? So now my question is, it's kind of matters of eggs and chickens, which should we first enable the environments and then create job for women? Or first we create job and then create an enabling environment for women to go and work? Right, thanks. We'll take one more question. Yep. Thanks, Alice. This is um, Kim from the Philippines, and I work at Investing in Women. Uh, we're promoting women's economic empowerment in Southeast Asia. I think a related question to what was asked. Um, I wonder what role the care economy also needs to play in terms of addressing women's economic participation. It's really encouraging that you're talking about that, you know, that optimism through job creating economic growth, but we also see still um, that women's labor force participation in Southeast Asian countries remain low, and in countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, they've been stagnant for sometimes decades, right? Um, and there's also data from these countries showing that women drop out of the labor force in their peak childbearing years, some of them never to return. So um, what, role, uh, or what role does the care economy again play into this, and um, how do we need to involve men in terms of caring responsibilities to really address that gap. Right, okay, there we go. Uh, we'll take those two and then we'll come back to two more. So we, we're looking at that chicken and egg question about the enabling yes. environment and we're looking at women in care economy and some of those social norms um, cross-cutting on both of those issues, thanks. Okay, so these are great questions. So it's absolutely true, and going back to Claudia Golden, she shows even in the US, the big dra driver of the gender pay gap is that upon having children, women tend to step back from the labor market, they reduce their hours, and of course that you know inhibits their chances of getting top jobs, like going back to your earlier question, right? So if women are working shorter hours, shorter days, um, then they're not working full time, they're less likely to be promoted to management. So if you want women to be in the top jobs, then of course they need to uh, work longer days. Um, okay, so then the question comes, so I think we, let's, we need to be realistic about what can happen through development cooperation. So yes, everyone agrees that if women are expected to be perfect, ideal mothers and doting mothers, then they will spend a lot of time on care work and that will thwart their labor advancement. No question, no question. But how effective can any outside or, or any intervention be in changing those gender norms? Actually, there's very, very little evidence that it's possible to change those care norms. Those care norms actually change when women go into the labor force, when families see the benefits of women working, when female labor force participation became, becomes widespread and, and normative. So in East Asia, a hundred years ago, it was totally normal for Korean, Japanese women, uh, Chinese women to stay at home and focus on the children. They did not have some big gender sensitization saying that, you know, in Japan or Korea that women should work. What the big driver was job creating economic growth. That economic incentive made families say, okay, yes, it's beneficial for women to go out into work. So feminists in this room may disagree. They think, oh, you know, we need to tackle care. We need to work on care. But you can't. There's very little evidence that any intervention on changing gender norms around care has been effective. So I think we should be realistic and pragmatic and look in the real world, what really drives change is job creating economic growth. Because then, and universities also, because then women are seizing those opportunities and families renegotiate things. For example, if you look at, so China uh, was an incredibly patriarchal country, but if you look at uh, Chinese social media uh, on little just like the Chinese Instagram. Women are speaking out, women are challenging unfairness. 
think we're losing you there. You're just broken up. All these inequalities, people have to bring the chicken. What happens is families see the economic opportunities, they see the economic advantage, women go into work, women go to universities, and then they start being critical. Then they start pushing for changes themselves. Then they start consuming the social media that makes them become more critical. It never, ever happens the other way around. In country, so yes, for me, if you look at the global evidence, it's it's definitely that one direction, and I will, yes. Fantastic. Now so that may disappoint people who say yeah. we need to work on changing care norms, but I just say, fine, it care matters, but it never, ever, ever, ever goes the other way around. Okay, great. Now we just have time for probably two more quick questions. So we here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Evans. And this is Hien from Cambodia and working uh, at Vien Peacemaker, which is an intersectional organization working on peace and gender. And thank you for sharing your thoughts and uh, probably connecting with two other uh, colleagues who were just asking a question earlier. Connecting to that one, because when we working at a community with minority groups, uh, such as Jam Muslim, for example, or people of women and girls from stateless community, for example, they have jobs. But the thing is that when it comes to acknowledgement among the family, it's not enough and they receive a lot of pushback when they want to stand up and speak for themselves. So my question is that beyond just looking at the job creations and, or inclusive economic growth whatsoever, can we also probably, I think there's a lot of other things that probably need to look at, specifically deeper structure, the deeper structure that we need to change the power and balance uh, between men and women or people of diverse soji, for example. I think that probably something uh, we probably have to look at as well, and especially from an intersectionality lens, because minority groups or people with diverse soji or, pe or probably stateless community do not have even access to those uh, economic growth type of things. So just want to hear your thought on that beyond just economic. There are probably other things that probably we need to look at. Thank right, you. Okay, we're going to take one more question up here in the back and then um, we're going to get a final answer and then we're going to hand over to Stephen to close. Uh, thank you, Dr. Evans, for your presentation. Uh, my name is Rigid Grover and I work for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade here in Australia. Um, and so I, I really understand your central argument that job creating economic growth is driving women's empowerment. Um, my question, and this is something that I used to say as a former labor economist at the World Bank going around telling governments this, but since have been quite critical of this liaison between, between these two f variables. So my question to you is what kind of jobs? Because it can be quite dangerous to keep on pushing women just into the formal labor market without asking what kind of jobs and what kind of working conditions Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so these are two brilliant questions. So absolutely. So one, not all work is emancipatory. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, if you are work, you know, drudgery in farm work, you know, that is labor force participation, but you are just working, you know, picking apples or whatever, that is not changing your views about your beliefs. You may still think that men are more knowledgeable authorities. When I worked in the, Cam when I lived in the Cambodian village for three months, female labor force participation was high in fields, but it was men who gather in the cafe, men who go to the cafe, men who share ideas from Radio Free Asia, from Facebook. They, they solve community problems, like, you know, they needed a generator because of the drought. Men become revered as knowledgeable authorities, even if women are working. So certainly rural work is no guarantee of female autonomy or empowerment. And certainly um, it's true that in, you know, when East Asia was industrializing, many people, many people on the left were decrying the horrific abuse of factory conditions, right? Factory sweatshops, they're terrible, they're awful. You know, and I am not here as a, you know, a capitalist neoliberal shield saying, yay, get women in sweatshops. No, but we need to understand that the East Asian miracle, if we look at Singapore, for example, when people are relatively poor, they compete in the global marketplace by selling their labor. And then what you also need to see is improvements in productivity, improvements in export complexity. And as countries improve in export complexity, in selling skilled work, then people move up that global value chain, right? Now, East Asia has done that very well. Bangladesh has not. Its export complexity remains flat. So that is the problem. Bangladesh has always focused 
in being the absolute cheapest in the world at making basic tops like my t-shirt. It is not a fancy t-shirt, right? So Bangladesh competes on price. It has seen no improvement in uh, complexity. And so for that reason, workers are always paid a terrible, terrible wage with 62 cents an hour or something horrific. Right. But whereas other countries that have become more economically complex, where the labor share of income has grown, where people can start buying local goods and services, then you see, you know, more demand for office work. Then you see women could be work, you know, in Thailand, in Cambodia. When I go, women are, you know, getting better jobs in offices, for example. So it's part of the process of economic growth that you want to move from the bottom right up to the top, right? So I am not here to defend farm work or crappy jobs in factories. It is that process of ultimate of development, right? Development. Development is the great job creating economic growth. And I center not just jobs, but economic growth so that you end up in those nice office jobs, for example, where women can share ideas. So absolutely, it's those two points. It's the job creation and the economic growth. But let me let me add an important caveat that absolutely so jobs are important not because women are economically dependent, but because women can build solidarity outside the family. So universities are a hugely important part of this. So universities enable women to share ideas, to live independently, to form new female friendships, female friendships outside the family supporting each other, because then they start becoming more critical to question things for themselves and to gain status. Um, but none of this happens automatically just by having a job. So two days ago, I was speaking to a woman from rural Tajikistan. So in Tajikistan, there is a strong deference for family elders and respecting your parents. So even though she'd been to, she was a maths teacher, the, her parents said, you need to get married, you need to get married to this guy. And her idea is, you know, you show respect to your parents by respecting what your parents say. So she had married their choice of husband, and he turned out to be incredibly abusive. And of course, across the world, domestic violence is normalized and women tolerate it because they worry about their children. They sacrifice themselves out of love for their children and they endure this domestic violence. In many parts of the world, especially where domestic violence is high, women say, you know, men are justified in beating their wives. So that is why I really put this slide about, you know, saying you've got to publicize zero tolerance. You've got to make people believe you've somehow got to give the credible signal that everyone else in the community thinks that only a barbaric savage would beat his wife. You've got to send the message that there is strong community disapproval, right? So people typically in close-knit poor communities care what other people will think of them. So you've got to send, somehow create the message, whether it is by sitcoms, whether it is by television, that everyone else will think that you are the worst person in the world. You know, you can think that I'm a bit retrograde for this, but you've got, you know, public shaming, you know, giving the public shame that it's a shameful thing to beat your wife, that everyone else is disapproving you, everyone else is judging you for beating your wife and the government will lock you up. Now, it's difficult to send the Singaporean style message in countries where government effectiveness is weak, right? Where people don't trust the police, where there's lots of corruption, then it's harder to do the Singaporean style message, but you can capitalize on social capital, social networks and social disapproval and create the stigma that you know only only a barbaric man would beat his wife thank you for that um, so Dr. thank you for Evans. Those yeah gonna have to, I, we're gonna have to start to end it there because we're past agree time with your points and i hope i'll yeah, job right. creating growth wonderful sorry sorry so you've raised sorry, I apologize. yeah you've raised a number of issues it's a very complex area i think a few things we can all agree on zero tolerance for domestic violence it's never okay it's never okay and we will all be better off if we can get more women into the workforce, if we can ensure safety within that workforce, if we can remove the barriers, and there are many, many barriers which stop them from moving up through the workforce so that we can remove those barriers. You know, part of that's looking at care, part of it's looking at sexual harassment in the workforce, part of it's looking, for example, I learned the hard way in one of the countries I was working that um, the most dangerous time for a woman in terms of domestic violence was when she got promoted. And that was the time we really needed to make sure she had a safety plan because it was her you know, family members who were jealous of her, et cetera, and that put her at risk. So we need to keep women and support women in our own countries and our own systems and international systems um, to be able to get into the workforce, be safe at the workforce, 
remove the barriers to, to move up and to be in management, and when we do that, everyone's better off. I think we can all agree on those important issues. Um, with that, I'm going to hand to um, Stephen to close. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you, Stephanie, for chairing, and thank you, uh, Dr. Evans, for your great uh, presentation. I think you made us all, all think, and I also want to uh, thank Alice for not just putting, preparing the slides, but she's actually written up her entire talk. It's on her Substack, and uh, we'll put up the link to that if we haven't already on the Hoover conference app. So get your conference app, and um, yeah, it's a great speech. It's already there uh, for you to read and dissect, uh, critique, and discuss. Uh, so that's our first session. I think we got off to a good start. We're now going to go straight to our second session, uh, which are two book launches. So if you're interested in education uh, and aid, uh, go to the Western Theatre for the launch of a book, Education Reform and the Learning Crisis in Developing Countries. And if you're interested in fragile states, go to the Barton Theatre for book launch, State Fragility, Case Studies and Comparisons. We'll then take a break and we'll then all be in the Western Theatre for a launch of a report on supporting local leaders. And then please do stay for the opening reception. There'll be drinks at five o'clock in the Crawford Courtyard. Thank you, everyone. Please join me in, think in thanking uh, Stephanie and Dr. Alice Evans.